Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Fundamentals of Pesach, part number two. Last week, we focused on how to prepare for Pesach regarding getting rid of your chametz and other preparations that need to be done. Today, we are going to focus specifically on how to go about doing the Pesach Seder. So a Pesach Seder, of course, is the first night of Pesach, what Pesach is famous for. Outside of Israel, we actually do two Passover Seders, one on the first night, one on the second night. In Israel, they only have one. And it's one of those, if not the most unique, uh, exciting nights on the Jewish calendar where you have a lot, a lot going on. So first of all, the word Seder or Seder in Hebrew means order. And that's because there's a particular order of what's going on over here. There is 15 steps to the pace of Seder. And as we go through the night, one step, two step, three steps, four steps, we go through all of the mitzvot instructions that we have for the Pesach Seder for that night. All right, so let's begin. On the, pay, on the night of the Pesach Seder, that would be this year's Monday night, the first night of Passover. So we sit down to a Pesach Seder. Before we even begin the Pesach Seder, we are going to set up in front of ourselves a Seder plate, right? We have a Seder plate in front of us. So what's on the Seder plate? On the Seder plate, or more uh, accurately, underneath the Seder plate, we have three whole matzahs. So you look for actually complete matzahs, and you put out three matzahs. Now, you all know that on Friday night, we have two challahs. Whenever we make the hamotzi blessing on a Friday night on the bread, we try and take two. So tonight we're taking three whole matzahs. So that's kind of, we stack them on top of each other, one, two, and three. And uh, they're going to be in front of us throughout the Passover Seder. And we'll talk about what we do to each one as we go through. Then on top of that, we prepare a plate with six items that are going to be on the Seder plate. In the top right corner, we have what's called the Zroa. The Zroa, some people use a shank bone, a lamb bone. The Chabad tradition is to actually use a chicken neck, uh, which we roast over an open fire, and then remove some of the, or most of the meat actually from the bone. This item on the Seder plate will not be eaten. Nobody's going to eat it at all. It's not going to be, not going to be touched. It just sits in front of us. And it is to remind us of the Korban Pesach, the Passover sacrifice. So back in Temple times, if we lived in Temple times on the evening of Passover, we would actually all be bringing a lamb as a sacrifice to the temple and then eating that lamb on an open fire. So Passover during Temple times had a whole different uh, element, an added element to it, which was that there was meat involved. You were on an open fire on a spit. You were cooking lamb. And in addition to eating matzah and maror and all of those things, you were eating the Passover uh, sacrifice. We, of course, don't have a temple, so we can't eat it. So we put this shank bone slash uh, chicken neck out on the plate in front of us as a reminder of that sacrifice. So why a chicken neck if it was a lamb? Good question. I don't know. The shank bone, I understand. All right. On the top left corner, we are going to have a hard-boiled egg. And this hard-boiled egg will get eaten at some point during the Seder. And this hard-boiled egg is to remind us of another sacrifice called the Korban Chagiga. So three times a year, a Jew had an obligation to show up at the temple. That was Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Those were three times a year. And each time the Jew showed up, he would have to bring different kinds of sacrifices. One of those sacrifices was called the Korban Chagiga, which means the holiday sacrifice. So to commemorate that sacrifice, which we too obviously are not bringing, we have the hard-boiled egg on the Seder plate. All right. Then in the middle of the Seder plate, we have um, Maror. And Maror is, um, according to the Chabad tradition, piece of romaine lettuce or two pieces of romaine lettuce with some freshly ground horseradish. 
So that's what you will see on the Seder plate. Then you have on the, again, on the right-hand side, but a little bit lower, you have haroset. Haroset is this mixed dish of apples, nuts, pears, and uh, nut, apples, pears, nuts, and wine all ground together. That looks like some sort of like a paste. And that, of course, we're going to use throughout the Seder as well. So that we have in front of us on the Passover Seder ready for when it needs to be used. On the left-hand side, a little bit lower than the egg, you have a vegetable that you are going to use when we dip a vegetable in salt water. So many Jews use parsley and those kind of things. The Chabad tradition is actually to use an onion. And if not an onion, to use a potato. And lastly, you have another uh, maror. You have a second uh, you have a second serving of this romaine lettuce together with a freshly ground um, horseradish. So these six items are sitting in front of you on the Passover Seder. And once that is ready, we are now be ready to begin the 15 steps of the Passover Seder. So two horseradishes? Two, because you we're going to see soon that you eat maror, you eat the bitter herbs twice. So... Romaine lettuce with some horse radish once. Another time, romaine lettuce with horse radish. Correct. You need it twice because we're going to eat maror. We're going to eat bitter herbs throughout the seder twice. All right. So now we begin the Passover. Now we're ready to begin the Passover seder. The first step of the Passover seder is called kadesh. Kadesh means we are going to recite kiddush just like we would any Friday night or any holiday where we begin by taking a cup of wine, reading the verses from the Torah that describe the specialty of the day. We sanctify the day over a cup of wine. That is how we begin the Passover Seder, by saying Kadesh. A few interesting things that you have to know about Kadesh on the Passover Seder, which is as follows. Usually on a Friday night, when it comes time for Kiddush, the leader or one person, the dad of the house, one person makes Kiddush and everybody else, if they want, they can sip a little bit of wine. If they don't want to sip, sip a cup of wine, they don't have to. On the night of the Seder, everybody needs to fill up a cup of wine because there is a obligation to drink four cups of wine at the Passover Seder, regardless of if you're the one leading or not. Everybody, men and women at that table. Or grape juice. Or grape juice, correct. Alcohol is not good for you. You should be using grape juice. And I'm going to talk about the amount of wine in a minute. You're going to see that it's not a lot. So everybody has to have a cup of wine. So everybody fills up their cup of wine. Tradition is to fill an overflowing cup of wine. And while we recite Kaddish, everybody holds their cup of wine. And when it comes to drinking, everybody's drinking a cup of wine. When we drink the cup of wine, men, they are going to lean to their left in a reclining fashion. So throughout the Passover Seder night, there are numerous times when we need to eat or drink. So all four cups of wine, and any time you're eating matzah, those are the times you eat reclining. So you actually, specifically to the left, regardless of if you're right-handed or left-handed, you do like a, you know, like a real, a real recline. A lot of people will bring a, an extra pillow, and a lot of times people have these beautiful pillowcases, but you you do like a full on a full on recline, um, and that is because in the olden days people would be uh, that was the way of free people to eat in this kind of style in leaning to the left. So only men have to lean to the left; women don't have to lean. And uh, like I said, regardless if you're right-handed or left-handed, you lean to the left. And when drinking the cup of wine. You lean to the left. So here's an important here's an important thing. Whenever we um, eat matzah or drink wine on the Passover Seder night, there's amounts that have to be eaten or drunk. It's not just a sip of wine. So when it comes to wine, you have as follows: the cup that you're using should be at least a three and a half ounce cup, which by the way is less than half of the classic cup. When you buy a cup from the store, you're looking at a six to eight ounce cup. So a cup over here doesn't mean like eight ounces of wine. Right? No matter the time the night is done, that, by the time the night is finished, you're going to be uh, 
hurt out of your mind, right? So a cup, according to the halachic, which means the, the legal, the Jewish legalistic amount, you need a three and a half ounce cup and you don't have to drink the entire cup, although it's better to, you could land up drinking majority of the cup. So majority of three and a half ounces is approximately two ounces. So if you have a three and a half ounce cup and you want to drink majority, so you're drinking two ounces of wine, each, each cup of wine. If your cup is a little bigger, it's a five ounce cup. You're drinking three ounces of three ounces of wine. So a cup of wine doesn't mean each time you're drinking wine, you're drinking a full eight ounces of wine. A cup of wine, again, is majority of the cup, and the cup has to be a minimum of three and a half ounces. So a lot of people try and find small cups that meet this requirement. Even if you have a four ounce cup and you're drinking two and a half ounces, uh, you're fine. Although when it comes to the fourth cup of wine, you should try and drink the entire cup of wine, not just majority. With me? A lot of wine. But not so much wine. Because if you're drinking two ounces of wine, that's nothing. Two ounces of wine times four, you land up drinking eight ounces the whole night. That's all. That's nothing? Eight ounces of wine. Six to eight ounces is like a normal glass, glass of wine. It's a glass of wine. Over, over three, four hours is not a lot. It's nothing. No, I'm agreeing with you. The problem is that you need to drink the majority of the cup. So if you have if you have one of these huge goblets, you have an eight ounce cup, then you need to be drinking each time at least four and a half ounces. So then four and a half times four, okay, now you're at 16 ounces or whatever it is. But if you have a four ounce cup, if you have a four ounce, a three and a half ounce cup or a four ounce cup and you're drinking majority two, two and a half ounces, even if you're drinking the whole entire cup as I, I'm gonna try and do, Four ounces of wine times four stretched over three, four hours, you know, you should be fine. Also depends how strong your wine is. <laughs> you can get uh, wine which is not so strong. All right. Grape juice. Or if if you need, if need be, you could you should use grape juice. Um, maybe try and mix it a little bit. Depends for what reason you're not drinking, you're not drinking wine. You know, if a person has a has an issue with alcohol and it's potentially life-threatening, then yes, absolutely you should stay away from wine thousand percent. Please do not drink wine. If you just don't love it, so then you can mix a little bit of wine with your grape juice um, as well. But yes, grape juice is 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 an option if you cannot drink wine. The other thing that I wanted to say is that ladies are going to light candles before the Passover Seder begins. And when lighting candles, they're going to say the blessing of Sheikh Yanu. Men do not light candles. They are going to then say the Sheikh Yanu blessing while making the Kiddush. So during this first step of the Seder, during, called Kaddish, men are going to, or the ladies that didn't light candles, whoever needs to, whoever has not yet recited the Sheikh Yanu blessing, will go ahead and recite the Sheikh Yanu blessing. All right, so at this point, we have gone to the first step of the Seder. We've drank a cup of wine, which could be two ounces of wine. The men drank it while leaning to the left. We've recited Kiddush, as we would on any night of the Seder, on any night, any holiday, any Shabbat, and we are ready to, to get going. We then reach the next step of the Seder, which is called Urchatz. Urchatz is where we wash our hands as we would wash our hands before eating bread but we do not recite a blessing afterwards. So usually before you eat bread on any day of the year, on any Shabbat, the way it works is you go and you fill up a cup of wine, of water, so fill up a cup of water, yeah, and you pour three times on your right hand, starting from your uh, wrist all the way to your fingertips where there's enough water to cover the whole entire thing. Actually, you want to separate your finger slightly so the water can reach all the different parts. So it's not just a little fingertip. Right? It's three... That's why you'll see a washing cup in any Jewish house. In the synagogue, you'll find a washing cup with two handles, and it's a nice size cup. So three times on your right, beginning from your wrist, all the way to your fingertips, one, two, three. Three times on your left, you know, one, two, three as well, all over your hand, each time full of water. And that's how we wash our hands for bread. After we wash our hands for bread, we usually say the blessing called Baruch Atah Donai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Asher Kedishanu Mitzvotah V'Tzivanu, Al Netilat Yadayim. Just thanking Hashem for the mitzvah of washing our hands. That's usually. In this case, the second step of the Seder called Urchatz, we wash our hands in the same fashion, but we do not say the blessing. So you wash your hands three times on your right, three times on your left, and we don't say a blessing. 
We then come to the table and we're ready for the third step of the Seder. And the third step of the Seder is called Karpas. Karpas is where we take our vegetable. So we have it on the Seder plate in front of us. As I mentioned, it's an onion or a uh, oh, potato, okay. not the bitter herbs, but the onion or the potato. Some people use a parsley and you're going to dip it into salt water. After you've dipped it into salt water, you say the blessing that you say whenever you eat vegetables. So the blessing is Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Malach HaOlam Orei Peri HaAdama Thank you Hashem for creating the uh, fruits of the earth, vegetables. And then you eat the karapas, you eat the vegetable, uh, and you do not lean. Because in this case, it's to remind us of the slavery. Whenever we do eat food that are remind us of the slavery, that don't represent freedom, we do not lean. But two important things about eating the karapas. Number one, when you say the blessing, ha'adama, you say the blessing on the food, you have in mind the bitter herbs, the lettuce, the romaine lettuce that you're going to eat later. Because if you don't have it in mind, then you potentially have to make another blessing, but you potentially don't because it was in front of you. So you land up in this legal conundrum. So better that you have in mind. So this blessing, Adama, also applies to the, to the food I'm going to eat later on, and you're fine. That's number one. Number two is when you eat, you're supposed to eat less than a kazayat. So kazayat literally translates as like the size of an olive. It's kind of the halachic amount that constitutes a, an eating. So if you eat a full kazayat, you eat enough, you're going to be required to make an after blessing, which again enters you in this legal conundrum because you're, you're kind of in the middle of a meal, but you're not really in the middle of a meal. So we try deliberately eat less. And so it's not about eating a lot, even though when we were kids, we loved eating it, especially because we were starving for some reason by the time it came to the Seder, because it took so long to get started. So we used to eat a lot of potatoes dipped in salt water, but you're not actually supposed to be eating a lot. You're supposed to be eating just um, a little bit. As I mentioned, you don't want to eat too much, which would require you in making an after blessing. Then you have all of these issues. All right, so that's called karpas. It's a potato or an onion or parsley, whatever it is, dipped in salt water. Blessing of the ha'adama, which is just a blessing you say when you eat um, vegetables. And you eat the karpas and you do not lean to the left. All right, moving on, we get to the next step of the Seder, which is called Yachatz. Yachatz is, we remember you have these three matzahs in front of you. You go to the middle matzah and you break the middle matzah in half. You then take out the bigger piece of those two halves of the matzah and you break it, you take the bigger piece, you break it up into five smaller pieces and you put it in a bag or wrapped up safely. And this will be eaten later on in the Seder for the piece of matzah called the afikoman. This is the typical time where people hide their afikoman and the kids go hunting or looking for the afikoman. Believe it or not, it is not the Chabad custom to kind of have that game, if you would, where the parents hide the afikoman and the child steals it and then only gives it back if the uh, parent offers him a prize. It is a well-known custom and tradition amongst many, many, many Jews, but it is not a Chabad custom to play the game. Of so you eating. break it in half. So Break it in half. So there's, so the, middle, there's the three matzahs in front of you. Right. So you go into the, you go in, you take the middle matzah, you break the middle matzah in, in two, uh -huh. and now you take out the larger of those two pieces. Once you have the larger of those two pieces, you leave behind the smaller one. That stays there. The larger of those two pieces, you further break that into five pieces. And you're going to hide it and put it away to be eaten much later for the matzah called the afikoma matzah, which we'll talk about when we get there. Does that make sense? All right, so at this point, we are up to the step called Magid. So we've done Kadesh, we drank a cup of wine, we made Kiddush, we washed our hands, we dipped a vegetable, we broke the middle matzah, put the bigger piece away for the Afikoman. 
We're at the fifth step called Magid. Magid is where we are going to tell over the story of the exodus of Egypt. This is a biblical mitzvah. There is a biblical, from the Bible, instruction that on the night of Passover, we should tell over the story of the exodus. Not only that, but it says clearly in the book that we use throughout the Seder called the Haggadah, that the more we tell the story, the more praiseworthy it is. So we're going to try and tell the story in great length, and we're going to try and give all of the details, and so on and so forth. And we begin the whole telling of the story with the famous Manishtana, right? which is asking why is tonight different than all the other nights, which typically is asked by children. But it's important to note that even if one is doesn't have any children at the Seder, they still ask the Manishtana. Or even if one is sitting alone, he still says the Manishtana. And over here, there's basically these four questions. Why is tonight different than all other nights? And the reason why we ask questions before we begin telling the story is because the Torah says that when your child will ask you about the Passover night, you should tell them the story. So the Torah kind of says that we are supposed to tell over the story of the Exodus of Egypt in a way of question and answer. If the child is questioning or somebody's asking a question, then we are providing an answer. So we set the stage in such a way where the questions are asked, why is tonight different? Why are we eating matzah? Why are we eating bitter herbs? Why are we leaning? Why are we dipping? All of these different things. And then we can say, oh, you want to know why tonight's different than all other nights? That's because our fathers were slaves in Egypt and Hashem took us out with an outstretched arm and so on and so forth. So then throughout the step of Magid, which is where the majority of the reading is, we tell the story of how we were in Egypt and how we have the obligation to tell the story. How there's four sons and each son requires a different kind of explanation and what happened when God took us out and uh, how there was 10 plagues and so on and so forth. Um, all throughout this section called Magid, this is what takes up the most pages because it goes on for quite a bit of time, where we're reading in great length. And eventually we come to the towards the end where we say, thank you, Hashem, for all of these miracles that we did. We have the Dayenu, right? If God would have done even one miracle for us, that would have been enough. But God did more. And if God would have done even two miracles for us, that would have been enough. But he did more and more and more and more. And when we come to the end, end, end of telling over the story, we pick up our second cup of wine. Now, obviously, throughout this section called Magus, there's a lot of very, very important um, sections that I'm just not getting into right now because now it's just a walk through the Passover Seder. But when it comes to the end, we pick up a cup of the second cup of wine. And in the same fashion that we did with the first cup of wine, right? Same amount, same leaning to the left, everything the same. We say the blessing, which is thanking Hashem for the wine. And we drink the second cup while leaning to the left. But this usually takes up a considerable amount of time because we have to tell the whole story and the kids ask the questions and there's some songs and we provide insights and so it's supposed to be a discussion and questions and answers and you know philo philosophizing and, and reading through everything and so on and so forth so at this point in the seder we are now ready to eat the matzah that is what we are going to be doing right now so let's talk about eating the matzah so that's part six eating the matzah is going to be part six Well, no. Eating, washing our hands for eating the matzo will be part six, and eating the matzo will be part seven. So, in other words, eating the matzo is made up of a couple of different pieces. So, eating the matzo is as follows. Let's talk about eating the matzo. First thing you have to know about eating the matzo is that eating matzo on the Passover Seder night is also a biblical mitzvah. So, biblical mitzvah number one was to tell the story. Biblical mitzvah number two is to eat matzah. There's rabbinic mitzvahs, which is drinking four cups of wine and eating the 
But biblical mitzvah is telling the story and eating the matzah. So eating matzah, we have to eat uh, uh, an eating. How much is an eating? So an eating of matzah lands up being, can you imagine one of those round shmura matzahs? Picture that in your head. Basically one third of those matzahs, one third of a round shmura matzah, which by the way is not so much, in four to six minutes while leaning to the left. That's eating matzah. Eating matzah is one third of a round shmura matzah, those round handmade matzahs, approximately, because depending how thick it is, or one third in four to six minutes and under, ideally under four minutes or under six minutes while leaning to the left, right? Because otherwise, if you just nibble and it takes you 20 minutes to eat, that's not really called eating. So there's, there's definition to what eating is. Now, this is not impossible. You take one third of a matzah and you eat it. It's designed to be the amount a person, a regular person would eat in a normal amount of time. It's not meant to be a rushed experience. This is the uh, kind of a designation of how much a regular person would eat, right? If you eat less than a third, it's not really an eating. It's more of a snack. If it takes you 20 minutes. That's not either a regular, that's not an eating either. So eating it in less than six minutes, one third of a matzah is what we call eating. So assuming you don't, you know, chit chat while you're having the matzah, but you just focus on eating the matzah. It's not difficult to eat one third of a matzah in less than six minutes. It's not, it's is, not impossible. Is liquid allowed? Uh, you're saying between what you're eating? Theoretically, I don't see why not. I mean, maybe it's disturbing. It's morning. It's fine. It's fine. So you could be eating and definitely before and definitely after. You could have a drink of water. Water or whatever. Yeah. So we're going through the steps of the Passover Seder. We're up to the part about eating the matzah. So how does the eating the matzah work? First, we go and wash our hands the same way we would wash our hands whenever we eat bread. So again, like we said before, you go to the sink, you fill up a cup of water, and you're going to pour three times over your right hand, each time from the wrist to the fingertips, lots of water separating your fingers, so get in between three times on your right, three times on your left. And then this time you do make the blessing, so after you wash your hands, you say the blessing, at which point you're not supposed to speak until you eat it, the matzah. Same as Friday night, when we wash our hands for bread on Friday night, we wash our hands. We say the blessing for washing our hands, and ideally we're not supposed to speak until we eat the bread. Because we're washing our hands that our hands should be pure. So the reason you're not supposed to speak is because when you speak, you can lose track of where you put your hands. So you're supposed to stay focused on what's happening over here so that you don't by accident touch something, which will make your hands again impure. So, so for example, by the way, if you wash your hands, you're not supposed to then go and give a handshake to somebody who hasn't yet washed their hands. Because his hands are impure and my hands are pure. So now, now, now I, I impure my hands. So, Can you show someone they wash their hands? Yes. This is not washing with soap. Remember, this is a, for spiritual purity. So if I, you wash your hands and I wash my hands, so then if we touch hands, it's not a problem. So here, before eating matzah, you're going to have a similar, a similar thing going on. We wash three times on the right, three times on the left. And then we say the blessing, Al Natilat Al Natilat Yadayim. Now, without talking, we come to the table and now we're ready to eat matzah. Before eating matzah, you're going to make two blessings. The first blessing is the regular Hamotzi blessing. Whenever you eat bread, you say, Baruch Atalunayim, Hamotzi Lacham in Alas. Just thanking Hashem for the food. But then there's a second, second blessing to be said, which is the blessing on the mitzvah, on the instruction of eating matzah. So in general, with blessings, there's two different kinds of blessings. One of the blessings is thanking Hashem for benefit. You're benefiting from food, from drink. From There's another kind of blessing that you say before doing a mitzvah. Whenever you're going to do a, a mitzvah, put on tefillin, put on a talit, you always make a blessing. So here, before we're eating matzah, we make one blessing called hamotzi, just for eating the food. And a second blessing, al achilat matzah. Thank you, Hashem, for instructing us on eating the matzah. Why three times? Why not two times or four times? Is three significant for something? Yes, so there's a specific uh, amount of three. Although some people have the tradition of washing twice, 
Um, but basically, it's to ensure that it goes everywhere and covers all the parts and that if you don't wash properly the first time, potentially if your hands were impure, so when the water touches your hand, the water could become impure. So you do it just once, so you do it a couple of times to be able to make sure that you've cleared all Why not four or five times? The calculation basically works out to three, that you wash once, and if there's and you wash a second and a third time, then if any of the water that was there, the first water is still remaining that became impure, and then you washed it away, and then you washed it again. But many there are traditions that do twice. Nobody, I don't think anybody does once. Um, but twice, some people, and three times, some people. It all comes really from the times of the Beit HaMikdash and the times of the temple where you had a group of people called the Kohanim. The Kohanim used to eat special foods that they had to eat only in purity. We don't have to eat our food only in purity, but in the times of the Beit HaMikdash, the Kohanim had to eat certain foods only in purity. So it kind of just extended this rule that anybody, anytime they eat, bread or the equivalent of bread would have to wash their hands before they eat the bread. So here we make the blessing of hamotzi plus the blessing of eating the matzah and then we begin to eat um, the matzah. Now if you remember before we described that in front of the person leading the seder there's a seder plate and the seder plate has these three has these three matzahs. So um, this is where it kind of comes in um, now you're going to deal with the matzah in front of you so the way it works is that you first make, you hold all three or all two and a half matzahs and you make a blessing of hamotzi. Then you let go of the bottom one and you hold the top two and you say the second blessing. Um, and then if you have the, if you're the one with the plate in front of you, you actually have to eat some of the middle and some of the top matzah. So that's a bit more complex. If you're a regular guest around the table, so now you have to eat one third of the round Shmura Matzah. And as I mentioned before, you eat a one third while leaning to the left in less than four or less than six minutes. And with that, you fulfill the biblical obligation. Also important, by the way, that the matzah has to be eaten after dark. So if you're going somewhere where the Seder starts at six o'clock or 6.30, you have to eat matzah after dark, which dark is only at like 8.30, 8.35. Um, because until it gets dark, it's not yet the evening of Passover. So you don't fulfill the mitzvah unless it's the right day. Now, I, I understand the temptation to start to say it a little bit early, especially if you have kids, but uh, just recognize that if you're not doing it after dark, you're not doing the mitzvah in the right time. All right. We're now ready to move on to the next step of the Seder, which is called Maror. So we ate matzah. And now we're about to eat maror. Maror, the way we do it, as I mentioned earlier, is, is that it's romaine lettuce with freshly ground um, horseradish. Now I'm using the words freshly ground on purpose because a lot of times when you buy the jars, they mix in all sorts of other things and it's delicious with fish that doesn't necessarily get you your obligation of the mitzvah, especially the red one. You know the red one? The red one has a lot of beets in it. So that kind of uh, does away with the obligation. The white one may be a little bit better, but ideally you want to use romaine lettuce and freshly ground horseradish. Hey, good, how are you? Hello. Now, like everything, there is a amount that has to be eaten. So what's the amount? So the amount, I apologize that it's wet. You can see over here that the- Crying on it? Exactly. The amount is uh, you're going to eat. Um, if you want to eat straight up horseradish, so you need to eat one and one third of a rounded tablespoon. So not a tablespoon. If you want to eat straight up, <laughs> if you want to eat only horseradish, the good news is is that the way we do it is we use a uh a uh, romaine lettuce leaf. So you take one large leaf or two mini leaves, sprinkle it with a little bit of horseradish. Doesn't have to be, because you're using the leaf, doesn't have to be the tablespoon. Just sprinkle it with a little bit of horseradish. And that's the amount that you're going to have to eat for my roll, which by the way, is not a lot at all. One leaf plus a few, uh, two, two medium leaves or one large leaf with a little bit of horseradish. It's not a, it's not a lot at all. Now, 
What happened? You okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, we mentioned earlier that when we ate the vegetable dipped in the salt water, we said the blessing of ha'adama, the blessing on eating vegetables. So, and we had in mind that it's going to include the vegetables we eat later. So you don't have to make the blessing on the vegetables now, but you do make the blessing on doing the mitzvah of eating maror. So there is one blessing to be said at this point, which is the blessing of Sher Kedishan Mitzvotah V'tzivan Al Achilat Maror. We do not lean to the left because whenever you eat food, that's to represent the slavery or the bitterness we don't leave. And again, you have to eat it in less than four or less than six minutes, which would be very easy. One large, two medium-sized leaves, you know, is, is really not a big deal with a little bit of horseradish sprinkled on it, taking maybe 90 seconds to eat. And with that, you have done the mitzvah of eating maror. Okay? Now, just to make it exciting, we move on to the next step of the Passover Seder. Um, I'm sorry, one thing that I did forget is that before you eat the maror, you're supposed to dip the maror in the haroset. So remember early on, we spoke about having haroset on the plate in front of you. So before you eat the maror, before you eat that lettuce and horseradish, you dip it in the haroset, which is the nuts, apples, um, pears, wine mixture. You dip it in. You're not supposed to put too much haroset where it takes away the bitter taste. If when you're eating it, all you're tasting is this delicious haroset with apples and nuts, that's a problem because now you're not tasting. The whole point of the maror is to taste the bitterness. So you dip it a little bit, just a tiny drop, or you dip it and then shake it off a little bit. So you still taste the burny taste of, uh, of maror. Now we come to the next step of the Seder. So we've eaten matzah, it was on its own. We then ate maror. Now we eat matzah and maror again, but we eat them this time together as a sandwich. This step of the Seder is called korach. And basically there was an argument, or there is an argument amongst the sages, where on the night of Passover, you have to eat all of these things. You have to eat matzah, you have to eat maror, you have to, in temple times, eat a piece of meat from the sacrifice so they had an argument do you have to eat matzah maror meat each one as long as you eat each one you're fine according to some opinion that eat them all together at the same time in other words you have to physically put them in your mouth at the same time so we ate matzah and we ate maror but now we make a matzah maror sandwich so again we take one third of a matzah we break matzah that in half. maror not matzah harosis. well we're going to dip the maror and haroset again but that's just a small dipping. Whenever you eat maror, which is twice, so you you uh, you dip the maror in haroset. So we take the matzah, right? Um, we take the matzah, now from the bottom matzah, which we haven't yet touched, take the one third of the matzah, we break it in two pieces, and we're gonna make a sandwich, literally a sandwich. So matzah at the bottom, then goes lettuce with horseradish, and another piece of matzah on the top, dip your lettuce, in the haroset a little bit again, and we say a little saying. And basically it says, this is what a man called Hillel did in the times of the Beit HaMikdash. He would combine his Pesach sacrifice with his matzah and his maror, and he would eat it together. And this time, because we're eating matzah, we do lean to the left. So men lean to the left, pull on recline, and you eat your sandwich, very tasty sandwich. All it has is Matzah cracker, lettuce, and horseradish. What does shmura mean? Shmura means guarded. So we're careful too that the matzah we eat on Passover should be shmura guarded. So from the moment that they cut the wheat off the ground, it's under strict supervision that it won't come in contact with any moisture. Because wheat that comes in contact with moisture can potentially become chametz. Oh. All right, so we're now up to the next step of the Seder, which is called Shulchan Orech. And the Shulchan Orech is actually dinner. <laughs> because at this point, we still haven't eaten really any normal, regular food. We've been eating matzah, maror, we ate a, uh, a vegetable dipped in salt water, but nobody ate any uh, anything regular. So... If you remember, you have this Pesach, the plate in front of you, there's the egg. The tradition is that we begin the meal by eating the hard-boiled egg dipped in salt water. This is not like an actual must. It's not a, that's the tradition that we eat the egg dipped in salt water. 
Um, it is also not the Chabad tradition to lean, to recline while eating regular dinner. So you just eat uh, normal, regular, and you have uh, regular food, whatever you would eat. It, it, it's usually interesting because at this point in that evening, it's pretty late. You know, like if we start the Seder, uh, the official part of the Seder could only start at 8.30 because that's when it gets dark. So by the time we get through all of these steps that we've set up to until now, you know, at a rushed Seder, like we'll do on the first night, it's 10.30. So at the time you have dinner. Yeah. Maybe at a rushed Seder, maybe you get there a little bit earlier, 10.15. It's not uncommon for people to be eating at 11.30, 12 o'clock. You know? Mm. Um, Very healthy. Exactly. Yeah. So the only thing that they, now you eat, you eat uh, whatever you want to eat for dinner, whatever, fish, meat, soup, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to eat for dinner. Now, the only thing that you should uh, have in mind is when you're eating this dinner is that you still have to eat matzah one more time. Or the afikoman. So you make sure to eat, but leave room that you can still eat matzah one more time. Okay. All right. So you have your dinner and you finish. Everything is beautiful. And uh, now we're ready to move on to the next step of the Seder. Remember, the Seder has 15 steps, very organized, everything specific, what to do. The next step of the Seder is called Tsafun. And this is where we eat the Afikoma. So now we go back and we get our matzah, afikoma matzah. Remember, we hid the matzah. The matzah has been hiding. We bring it out. And like any time we eat matzah, we're trying to eat one third of a round shmura matzah, like that kind of size, one third of that matzah. Um, leaning to the left. And uh, this is going to be the last thing that one is supposed to eat for the night. After you eat this matzah, you're not supposed to eat anything else that evening. We will still drink two cups of wine, but you're not supposed to eat anything else. It's kind of like you're, you want to go to sleep, so to say, with the taste of matzah in, in your mouth. Now, before I said that the dinner could go late, but it's actually a little bit complicated because on the first night of the Seder, first night, you're supposed to eat this afikoman before midnight. Now, midnight does not mean 12 o'clock. Midnight means halachic, Jewish law midnight. So Jewish law midnight takes what time is what time did it get dark and what time will it get light and the halfway points. So Jewish midnight's not 12, it would mean more be like one o'clock or something like that. So you need to eat the afikoman before that one o'clock. So as much as you want to tell the story for hours, eat for hours, you have to be conscious that the first night, second night, you don't have that restriction, but the first night of Passover, you need to eat the afikoman before um the Halachic, the Jewish law, midnight. All right? So we eat the afikoman. Everybody eats the afikoman while leaning to the left. You ate a, a one-third of your matzah. That's going to be the last thing you eat for the night. And then we then move on to the next step of the Seder, which is called Beirach. Beirach is what we know as benching or Birkat HaMazon, Baruch right? Bazan Anytime we, we eat bread, we finish a meal, we thank Hashem for the uh, we thank Hashem for the for the food that we ate. So we do, right? People call it grace after meals, birkat amazon, call it whatever you want. Now, before you start benching, you are going to fill up another cup of wine, which is going to be our third cup of wine. And we also fill up a special cup of wine called the cup of Elijah. Elijah. So we put up on the table a special cup of wine called the cup of Elijah. We fill it up. And now we begin to do the benching, the Birkat Amazon. After we complete the entire benching, everybody takes their third cup of wine, says the blessing on drinking wine, Ore Priyagafen, leans to the left and drinks the third cup of wine. And is that still part of step 12? Um, that would be part of the third cup of wine as well. But I can't help thinking if these rules were developed by anti Semites in order to kill Jews. I mean, eating is this step midnight. 13. A 13? Okay. 
So 12 is, many times 12 is just the benching and then filling the wine, preparing the wine. No, because we lost count somewhere. On a... Off of Coleman, I thought was 11. Okay. Either way, this is what step is this? If you're telling me, we, okay, I had for 12 the prayer after the benching to fill the third cup of wine and the cup of Elijah and then to do the prayer. Yeah. All right. So we're off by one number, basically. Combined you. Right. That should be the 13th step. Which one? The whole, what I just said? Put 13 by, by drinking the third cup of wine. Okay. Now, at this point, we are going to go and do something which is very, very special, which is open the door for Elijah the prophet. So we have a tradition that we open all doors from that separate between where we're sitting and the street. Now, in America, that's usually only one or two doors. But where I grew up, that actually was this door. And the property where everybody lived was surrounded by a wall and a fence. Right, Your property was surrounded by, even the front of your property was surrounded. And there's a tradition, this is not like what you have to do, but if it's not Shabbat, if it's not Saturday, you actually take lit candles to the door. It's a very, it's a very spiritual experience because you're, you're after three you're cups, after of cups of wine, you, you, you know, late in the night, you've had a real, you're, you're working through a real experience. And now you're opening the door for Elijah the prophet. You're going, holding candles to the door. And uh, the, the tradition is that at this time, when we open the door for Elijah the prophet, the gates of heaven are open and a person should ask for whatever they, for whatever they want. It's a, it's a special time to ask for something, for ask Hashem, ask God for whatever it is that you need. This is like a, a special opportune time to ask for, for blessings. In fact, one time the... Uh, the previous Rebbe said that when he was a child, his father told him that he shouldn't waste the ask. He shouldn't ask for stupidity. If you, have, if you have an opportunity, what are you going to ask? For a new bicycle? For a new car? Right? So he said that you should ask Hashem for, you know, for real things, spiritual things, to give you an open mind, to give you a heart that can love and, and fear Hashem, to give you a great perspective. A person needs help. Whatever it is, but not to ask for, uh, you know, stupid stuff. That's what they told them. So this is a very, very special time. Unfortunately, a lot of people, they leave the Seder already. They, they're not even here. Because, you know, the Seder that I sit through, it's kind of like, as the night goes on, people start falling like flies. You know, it's like you start off with 50 people. By the time the night ends, you're down to maybe 10 or 15. Just... As the night goes on, sorry, Rabbi, I have to go. Sorry, Rabbi, I have to go. Sorry, Rabbi, I have to go. <laughs> 10 o'clock, one family. 10, 15, another family. 10, 30. But it's a pity. I know, I understand. It's not like I don't have any hard feelings. Just saying, Isn't it surprising? No, but it's a pity. It doesn't take a nap <laughs> in the afternoon. You know, eat at 5 o'clock in the afternoon so you're not hungry. And stay up. It's not so hard to stay up. Listen, if you have small kids, it's a different story. But the if children you're... know the part. Exactly. The part. No, if you have kids, it's a different story. But if you're an adult, <laughs> eat earlier. So you don't have to. Eat. You don't have to eat now. Take a nap. <laughs> drink a cup of coffee. You never stayed up till two o'clock in the morning before. It's not so hard, right? Well, I don't know people. It is uh, once a year. It's not impossible. <laughs> it's just make sure. Make listen, some people go to bed at two o'clock in the morning every every night. So you prepare yourself, you take a nap, exactly you make sure you can tomorrow. go, you can go to like, you can go to work late the next day. It doesn't have to go to two o'clock in the morning. It's a, it's a once in a life, it's a, it's a once a year experience. Anyway, the, my point is that a lot of people don't see this, but it's a very, very special time. We open the door for Elijah the prophet. Obviously you don't see him, but the idea is that there's tremendous blessing coming in. A person can ask for whatever he wants, take a few moments to recognize that it's a special night and so on. Which, by the way, the first night of Pesach is called Leil Shimurim which means the night of protection. And uh, this night, this is, the, this is the night that the Jewish people left Egypt, right? That's the night that God struck the firstborns at midnight and, and, the, and Pharaoh came to Moses and said, the Jewish people can go. And that's the, they left in the next morning. So this is a, it's a night of protection. In fact, 
One is supposed to, you know, take an action to show that they are, Hashem is protecting a person. Some would even leave their doors completely unlocked on the night of Pesach, which is a night of protection. Or if you have two locks, you lock one lock. You want to show that tonight is a night of, of, of protection. So an incredible night. The, the energy of the night is tremendous, right? The spiritual, it's a night of freedom. It's a night of breaking out of boundaries. It's a night of protection. This is where we're bringing down a tremendous energy into the world and into our lives on that night. Um, all right, so after we open the door for Elijah the prophet, um, and we say all of these things, we, we then um, we fill up the fourth cup of wine, and now we go to the last two steps of the Seder, which are really combined into one. And the last two steps of the Seder is we recite Hallel and another and a bunch of other paragraphs that praise Hashem for his greatness. So it's basically like a prayer now at this point. So you know Hallel. Hallel is the famous prayer that we say on great on special holidays. So we recite the Hallel. We recite much of the prayers that come, by the way, every day from the Saturday morning prayers, like Yishtabach, Yishtabach, Shimcha, Lad, Malkeinu. We go through all of that. Uh, if you have time and patience, you can sing through much of it. It's a lot of beautiful praises to Hashem for all of the miracles that he's done for us. And when we get to the end of all of that, it also takes a couple of minutes. We then say the blessing on the fourth cup of wine. We drink the fourth cup of wine while leaning to the left. And after that, we make an announcement and we say, Lashana Abba Yerushalayim. Make a one sentence prayer. We say, God, next year we want to do the same thing. But we want to do it in Jerusalem with the coming of Mashiach. And we sing, and we dance, and we've concluded our Seder. And with this ends the end of the Passover Seder. And so in Israel,